from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Today from the Kansas Department of Agriculture, Scott Marsh will discuss the newly approved procedure for developing regulations on industrial hemp production research in Kansas and changes to the state noxious weed control statute, which will streamline the process of adding new invasive species to the noxious weed list. Then K-State's Kurt Thompson will talk about the changes in crop weed control in Kansas over the past 25 years and the ongoing need for good stewardship in weed management, as Kurt is retiring from K-State next week after his long career. And for this week's K-State Horticulture segment, Jared Hoyle will talk about issues that are putting pressure on our drought-stressed home lawns and what to do about them. It's all here on Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. Welcome aboard for another Agriculture Today. First up for you here, particulars on action that was taken by the 2018 Kansas Legislature of interest to Kansas agriculture. and Introduces a new possibility in one instance and modifies very important regulations in the other. With us now is the state weed specialist, Kansas Department of Agriculture, Scott Marsh, and he is working on both of these items. The first of which is a bit far afield, actually, (laughs) when you think about the normal roles that you participate in, Scott, and that is the 2018 legislature did approve the research path for industrial hemp in Kansas. And you actually are working up the regulations for this. Is that correct? Yes, I agree. This is not something I saw myself doing this time last year, (laughs) but we've been working very hard since March to get these regulations in place so people can be able to start planting hemp uh, as a research project this coming year. As a research initiative and nothing more, need to stress that this is in its infancy, a long way from being a commercially approved alternative crop in Kansas, right? That's right. None of us have grown hemp in Kansas yet, and so we need to learn how to grow hemp and which varieties will work and which won't and which methods do or don't. So we are just doing research to find that out before we look at going into a commercial program. The KDA is working with academic interests, uh, with stakeholders in agriculture, just about everybody who might be involved in this alternative crop to assemble rules for research of the crop. Absolutely. There were six universities named in the state that could work with us on this. And uh, it also allowed us to license individuals to grow hemp as a research project under the Department of Agriculture. But those individuals or those agencies that would research industrial hemp, stressing that now, uh, will have to go through something of an arduous process for uh, certification, right? Yes. uh, There will be an application form to fill out. Uh, Once that's filled out completely, it will be passed on to an advisory board, and the advisory board will go through each of the applications and make recommendations from that list to the secretary as to who they believe should receive a license to participate in the research. And the finer points of that are being formulated as we speak. Yes. We do have a draft of the regulations established, and we've put it on our website so that people can take a look at it and offer comments uh, as to uh, what they think of it, if there's anything that should be in there that isn't. And then uh, we'll take those comments and and move forward in the process. Once a party is licensed, once all of that is fleshed out, uh, the guidelines that is, there will still be further regulations on how that research will be conducted, right? 
Yes, they will have their uh, research proposal, and uh, we will hold them to that. And then once they have a, a field planted or even a greenhouse planted to hemp, we will come out and inspect that, collect samples of what they're growing, and have it tested to make sure that it is industrial hemp and follows uh, the statute. They will be required to report to us at various times through the year as to what they're doing and how things are going and what they planted and what they've harvested and and all of that. Again, all of this is in the works, but you and uh, the others involved in the planning here and the uh, creation of the regulations are asked to report back to the legislature in the next session as to the progress? Right. Uh, again, this is this is a research program right now, but in January of next year, uh, the Department of Agriculture will report to the legislature as to what we see in the future as far as this research program becoming an all-out commercial industrial hemp production program. There is an opportunity for the public to weigh in on the process, is there not, via the website? Absolutely. Uh, Right now, like I said, we have a draft of the regulations on our website, which is agriculture.ks.gov slash industrial hemp. They can read through the regulations, and if they so choose, they can also make comments to us through the email, which accompanies the uh, draft regulations at kda.industrialhemp at ks.gov. And that way we will uh, be able to get new and different eyes looking at this and, and letting us know if there's anything that we might have missed or, or stepped over without uh, realizing it. And that's just an early informal public comment period. There will be a more formal one towards the end of the year at the end of the regulatory process. So the public has plenty of chances to uh, to follow this through and to get involved with it. For the here and now, those are the steps that are underway concerning the establishment of research of industrial hemp as an alternative crop in Kansas. Go to agriculture.ks.gov to find out more about how this is coming together. The other thing, Scott, that the legislature did approve, and this is right up your alley, having to do <laughs> with noxious weeds in Kansas, the process of naming a weed as a noxious species has been modified. Yes, we've been working on this for five years now. We finally got it through the legislature. We're really excited about this. The new process is uh, involves moving the noxious weed list from the law itself into the regulations. Hasn't happened yet. It won't happen officially until the end of 2020. But when it does... Instead of having to wait until a legislative session and try and work with legislators to add something to the list, we will be able to run it through the regulatory process, which uh, we can do at any time of the year. And we can have it the determination based on uh, more science than public opinion. And it could well expedite the process of having weed problems identified as noxious more readily and therefore reacting more timely. Oh, absolutely. And uh, on top of that, there's a new clause that allows the secretary to make an emergency declaration of a noxious weed if something new is found in the state and we want to attack it quickly and aggressively, we'll be able to list it under an emergency declaration. And with that, it'll be considered noxious for 18 months until the secretary goes through the regulatory process to add it permanently to this list or until the secretary chooses to remove it early. So it's not a it's not a way around the regulatory process. It's just an emergency stopgap measure. And even if it isn't an emergency situation, there is the new step by step process for establishing new weeds as noxious weeds. Uh, the K State will have a role in assessing the risk of a species. Right. Part of the science based process for uh, determining whether to list a species as noxious or not includes a risk assessment. Collecting research and filtering through existing research on the weed 
and uh, determining whether it is a candidate for a notches listing in Kansas. And we have a temporary format right now. We'll have to get final approval on that uh, in the future. But already, uh, weed science students here at Kansas State have been helping us do the research and fill out those risk assessments so that we have them available to look at when we need to make uh, determinations on whether to list a species or not. And on top of that, there will be considerable stakeholder involvement in the process in the form of an advisory committee? Right. Uh, The next step after the risk assessment is to present these risk assessments to our advisory committee. It involves uh, 13 members from landowners to county weed directors, weed specialists here at Kansas State, uh, members of the Department of Wildlife, and uh, agricultural industries in the state will take a look at these risk assessments, decide which, if any, of those weeds uh, they would recommend be listed, and then they would pass that on to the secretary. At that time, the secretary will uh, report to the legislature as to which species she is considering to have listed and then can begin the standard regulatory process for for adding them to the list. So there's still plenty of oversight here, but once more the process has been smoothed out to move things along more quickly. Absolutely, yes. Lots going on here, Scott, and it's covered in full at the website, be it on the noxious weed changes, be it on the approval of research protocol for industrial hemp. Yes, it's it's all there on the website, and they're welcome to, to call us and, and ask any questions they have. And we appreciate you coming over and filling us in. I appreciate it. you having me. Thanks, Eric. He's Scott Marsh, state weed specialist with the Kansas Department of Agriculture. Go to the department's website for information on these matters and, and many others, of course, agriculture.ks.gov. And we'll be back with more after this. You're listening to Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Well, something a little out of the ordinary here for our guest, whom you've heard from many times on this broadcast, is calling it a career next week after 40 years as a weed control specialist, uh, the majority of those with K-State Research and Extension. Kurt Thompson will be retiring this coming Wednesday. And Kurt, first of all, a hearty congratulations on this landmark for you. Uh, Thank you very much, Eric. It's an exciting time. You started your career, as we reflect back a bit, in your home state, correct? We did. As a uh, technician in the weed science program at North Dakota State University. At NDSU, I was four years as a technician, got my master's degree, then moved on to a general agronomist position at a uh, research station in the north central part of the state, still doing weed control work. Mm -hmm. And then... Something grabbed me, and we went back to school uh, at the University of Idaho and became a technician uh, in the weed control project. So we were getting the Ph.D. as well as providing technical support for the PI at the University of Idaho. Again, uh, still spraying weeds. (laughs) And then K-State came calling, and uh, you took up uh, what turned out to be an extended stay in Garden City for extension, right? Uh, Yeah, the area agronomist, and so we were involved in a lot of just general agronomic efforts, both education and and research, but I was always dabbling in, (laughs) in weed control. That's where my heart 
laid. So we did a lot of work actually at, at Tribune with kosher and pigweeds and all kinds of things, the different crops, weed management. So you came to the Extension Center there in Garden City in the early 1990s. As you worked in that region, what do you consider one of the major steps forward within your body of research down there or your outreach? Well, when we came to Garden City, some of the challenges that we were were dealing with was in irrigated corn. We had this nasty old grass called shatter cane. And we had some herbicides that we could use, ALS inhibitors, to control shatter cane. Uh, but we were seeing a increasing number of acres where those ALS grass herbicides were no longer working. And we were on the verge to become a, a very serious problem. But of course, what happened was glyphosate-resistant Crops came about with the corn and soybeans. Glyphosate was extremely effective at controlling uh, shatter cane, and if you had to spray it a second time or a third time, you could. So shatter cane and corn didn't really evolve as a serious problem in corn because of the new weed control technology that came with it. When the glyphosate came on board, of course, all of a sudden, we were controlling all the kosher. And in fact, we had a lot of clean fields in the countryside if they were corn or or soybeans. We were able to do a tremendous job managing. A couple of applications of the herbicide, and things were all cleaned up, and it Well, in theory, became too easy. We could get uh, lazy about controlling weeds. We didn't have to worry about a burn down. We just planted because we could come in with the burn down even after that crop come up and clean everything up, and you might have to spray it a second time and not an issue. The economics were right. That was for certain. And And it became increasingly economical because the price of glyphosate was was on the decline. We were always battling with kosha. Out west, in the irrigated acres, we had palm amaranth. And we also had a little bit of velvet leaf, which probably came from the feedlots. The seed came from imported corn, Mm -hmm. from the corn states. And so, really, when I first came to K-State, you could find velvet leaf, really not a serious problem. And now it's far more prevalent, uh, but we do have a number of herbicides that are very effective in controlling uh, velvet leaf. But what I have observed over the years is that palmer amaranth has moved out of the irrigated circles, and of course not only in dryland corners, but it's in dryland crop ground, not only in the central part of the state, but all the way west to the Colorado line. Mm -hmm. So it's become a much more serious problem than what it used to be when I first came. Kosha didn't go away either. Uh, When we were able to, in theory, annihilate it with glyphosate, we didn't eliminate it. Of course, with the glyphosate-resistant kosha and the glyphosate-resistant palmer amaranth, we continue to have some major challenges. Interesting that your career really paralleled the timeline of the accelerated adoption of no-till. So Mm -hmm. reliance on herbicides was just ramped up that much further, and and hence a whole slew of new product options came on and uh, so much to keep track of and test out, Kurt. Absolutely. I, You know, just for the fun of it, I pulled the weed guide out that K-State developed in 1978, the year that I started in weed control, not at K-State, but the year I started. And it's about 34 pages front to back. Mm -hmm. The weed guide today is 143. That suggests that, well, we do have a lot more tools, but our challenges, I think, are much greater today than they were Uh, back in 1978, to be honest with you. 
You've spent the last, what, a little over a decade on campus here at K-State, right? Yep. I came April 1st in 2008. And working on a statewide basis, not just southwest Kansas. Correct. But there seems to be a, a uniformity of problems. <laughs> Back to the resistance factor, by and large, right? Uh, we've got two glyphosate-resistant weeds that are widespread across the state. Palmer amaranth, mare's tail. Of course, we've got the glyphosate-resistant water hemp, but that tends to be contained to the eastern third of the state. And then, of course, we have kochia, glyphosate-resistant kochia, which is primarily in the western half of Kansas, where we have some serious problems. Yeah, there's some geographic differences, but Palmer would be the one that is the most widespread of our our problematic weeds. It's not done fighting yet. Kurt, you've worked with scores of producers, extension agricultural agents locally, other specialists here and in other states, as a matter of fact. And when we think about the challenge ahead, which largely revolves around avoiding further resistance difficulties with our weed populations out there, is headway being made in that better stewardship? Well, I think our growers have maybe a better understanding just because they are battling with resistance. The importance of doing some things very timely, uh, using pre-emergence herbicides, you know, and we've been really talking that pre-emergence herbicide up for a lot of years during the (laughs) early Roundup days and Roundup Ready crops. Economically, there was no reason to use a pre-emergence herbicide. And to tell them, well, you need to use a pre-emergence herbicide to help prevent the development of glyphosate-resistant weeds. And it isn't until glyphosate no longer controlled the weeds, now we see a large number of the spring planted acres with good pre-emergence programs. And, And it's an essential component anymore for effective weed control. Use pre-emergence herbicides, and when we are spraying post, we need to be spraying little guys. And I know that's a relative term uh, because what's little to some might not be little to others. And for me, when I'm saying little weeds, we're talking two, three inch weeds and not that 10, 12, 15 inch Palmer amaranth. You ask a co op to come and clean up a crop field that's got. 12, 15-inch Palmer amaranth, they cannot be successful. And you're not going to be happy with the job that they do. It's because you provided them with with a job that is really not attainable. So spraying two-inch weeds, you'll be a lot happier. Congratulations on a stellar career in this field, and it's always been a pleasure working with you and tapping your expertise that's been immensely valuable to our growers out there over the years. Kurt, thank you. Thank you much, Eric. It's been a pleasure. And the best in your retirement. He's calling it good after 40 years as a weed control specialist, 25 of those with Kansas State University. That's Kurt Thompson. He's retiring this coming Wednesday. This is Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. Eric Atkinson with you as we move on now with today's agricultural news headlines. These courtesy in part of DTN. 
Well, after the Trump administration announced it would move ahead on tariffs against $200 billion more in Chinese goods, possibly later this summer, the U.S. Senate voted overwhelmingly yesterday to include language calling for providing a role for Congress in making a determination of trade tariffs related to national security concerns. The language is non-binding, and it is watered down from earlier Senate demands, but the 88 to 11 vote still marks the first time that Congress has directly challenged President Trump's heightened trade conflicts, not only with China, but also the European Union, Canada, Mexico, and other trade partners over steel and aluminum tariffs. The vote reflects widespread concern in Congress on the impact of the administration's tariffs and greater risks of retaliation. That vote comes after the U.S. and China imposed 25 percent tariffs on each other last week on an array of products that included China's increased tariffs on U.S. agricultural commodities such as corn and soybeans. The U.S. is preparing to slap tariffs on another $16 billion in Chinese products this month and just this past Tuesday announced plans for another 10 percent tariff on as much as $200 billion in Chinese goods. Now, in a pair of tweets yesterday morning, the president said he was focusing on helping soybean farmers and insisted his trade policies will benefit producers in the end. Yet the American Soybean Association expressed extreme disappointment in the Trump administration's push to consider 10 percent tariffs on that other $200 billion in Chinese goods. The group says the action worsens the trade dispute between the two countries. The ASA said it was pushing on both the administration and Congress to receive send the current tariffs. Now, on Capitol Hill, the Senate motion was spearheaded by Senators Bob Corker of Tennessee, Jeff Flake of Arizona, and Pat Toomey of Pennsylvania as a way to ensure Congress plays a role in setting of national security designated tariffs. The Senate instructs congressional negotiators on a Waterways, Energy, and Defense Infrastructure Bill to include language requiring Congress to weigh in on such tariffs. The Senators also said they will continue to push for a stronger more binding vote on legislation they introduced in June to require congressional approval of national security designated tariffs. The Wall Street Journal quoted House leaders who seemed split on whether to challenge the president on tariffs at the moment. Quoting here House Speaker Paul Ryan, I don't want to hamstring the president's negotiating tactics, but I have long said I don't think tariffs are the way to go. Now, House Ways and Means Committee Chairman Kevin Brady of Texas indicated a more wait and see attitude. He said the plan was to wait and see how the president's trade policy works out. Meantime, Mexican President-elect Andres Manuel López Obrador will meet with three more top White House officials tomorrow, including Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, Homeland Security Secretary Kirstjen Nielsen, and White House Senior Advisor Jared Kushner. They're in addition to Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who was already set to meet López Obrador and his team in Mexico City to discuss the bilateral relationship. The officials are expected to discuss the NAFTA renegotiation economic development projects, and migration. Lopez Obrador reiterated yesterday that he'll continue to respect the negotiating positions from current Mexican President Peña Nieto's administration. He said, quoting here, we consider that NAFTA should be maintained in this time we're going to be observers. We recognize the work from the negotiating team, and we're going to be with them as observers to support and achieve a good deal. And yesterday, the new acting administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, Andrew Weather, addressed agency employees about the future of the EPA. In a 20-minute speech, Weather pointed a need to continue the work his predecessor, Scott Pruitt, did in reaching out to states and other industry stakeholders about the EPA's work. That has included the rewrite of the Waters of the United States rule. Weather did not take questions following that speech. When Pruitt resigned, ethanol and agriculture groups along with Midwest lawmakers celebrated because of the battles they faced on the renewable fuels standard the past 17 months. During his speech, Wheeler made no mention of the RFS or the WOTUS rewrite, but he did say, however, the agency under his leadership will continue restoring the rule of law and reigning in regulatory overreach. Next up on Agriculture Today, this week's Kansas soybean update. And with that is Greg Akagi. Greg?
Dr. Mark Messina, Executive Director of the Soy Nutrition Institute, joins us. And Mark, for those who have not heard of the Soy Nutrition Institute, what is it all about? Well, the SNI, for short, is a group that was started by the United Soybean Board in conjunction with industry members. And we are really dedicated to educating health professionals about the benefits of soy foods, including soybean oil. And we also conduct research to fill any gaps that might exist in the scientific literature. So we're really focused on trying to make the health professional and eventually the consumer aware of the benefits of consuming soy. And there are so many ways to convey that message as well through social media and through direct speaking engagements as well. As the executive director, I do uh, quite a bit of speaking. I speak to dietetic groups around the country. I also write a blog. Every couple of weeks, I post a, a new blog. And we also publish in the scientific literature articles about the health benefits of soy. Food. So we try to use as many approaches as we can to reaching the health professional, and our hope is that then the health professional can educate consumers about the benefits of soy. Because consumers nowadays want to know what's in their food and the nutritional value of their food, which soy can definitely provide. Absolutely. There are a lot of advantages to soy. Soybean oil, for example, just received a health claim from the Food and Drug Administration for its role in reducing risk of heart disease. Soy foods provide high-quality protein, so we really need to to get the word out there about the benefits of soy. Do you feel like you're making an impact with SNI on providing value to the industry, as, as you mentioned? Yeah, absolutely. We've uh, published quite a few uh, papers that are regularly cited by the scientific community. And if you actually look at the opinion of scientists, soy is held in very high regard. And I think the SNI has contributed to that impression of soy foods and an accurate impression. We just need to do a little bit better job making sure that these health professionals are communicating this information to the consumer because right now the consumer, of course, has so many options for getting information about nutrition and some of those options are not the best choices because the people communicating that information often don't have the appropriate scientific background. Dr. Messina, if people would like more information, what's the web address to get more information? It's the soynutritioninstitute.com and they can also go for more practical information to the soyfoodscouncil.com. That's Dr. Mark Messina, Executive Director of the Soy Nutrition Nutrition Institute, who joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Thanks, Greg. And this is Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Rounding out this agriculture today, it's our weekly K-State horticulture segment, Well, our home lawns around Kansas are going through a summer ordeal. We're going to highlight several things that you homeowners might want to be scouting for in your lawns and how to react to those. Jared Hoyle is an extension turf grass specialist with K-State Research and Extension. We'll begin with an insect problem that's all so familiar in our home lawns. Grubs, Jared, and you say they are getting after it now. They are, yes. Um, Grubs are commonly... um at this time of the year, starting to eat some of the roots off of our turf grass plants. Most of the time and during the year, you can put a preventative product down earlier in the season, but now we're getting, you know, a little later, maybe the product has run out or you forgot to get it out. So they're starting to see some grub damage, which commonly looks like uh, drought damage or insufficient irrigation. And then if you are having that, that issue with not getting enough rainfall, then your grub damage tends to just uh, be exacerbated and get more severe because they're eating the roots off of those uh, grass plants that are in the lawn. It really doubles down on the damage then. What to do about grubs if one confirms that they are active in their lawn? Now we're looking at something of a rescue treatment. What are the alternatives? There's a product out for uh, homeowners that is called Dilox, or the active ingredient is metacloprid. It is a Uh, insecticide that you can apply and you would want to water it in within 24 hours so if you have irrigation you can apply it because you want to get it down to where the grubs actually are 
this is not going to prevent any in the future, but what it's going to do is going to kill the ones that are there currently. Um, if you don't have irrigation, maybe try and plant it as best as possible before rainfall um, so that rainfall can get that product down into the soil. Mm-hmm. That will really help you out for the rest of the year. There may be some more damage later on, but that will at least get a good stopping point to the grubs. It'll tide one over until, well, conditions in general improve for our lawns and that, that drought stress hopefully will go away. Well, our next pest is on the weed side. Yellow Nuts Edge is an unwanted invader in many a lawn now, you say? Yes, that is correct. And uh, we see Yellow Nuts Edge. It is a grass-like plant, so it looks just like the grasses in there. Um, it does have edges on, on the stem, so it's a triangle stem, so that's a good way to identify it. Um, it grows faster than the rest of the lawn, so it typically sticks up. Um, it's a very tough-to-control weed because it has tubers, which are like the gigantic seeds, all interconnected in the soil. So even if you have one, um, you can go out there and pull it, and then that's going to end up stimulating the other tumors to grow. So a lot you of just make it mad, basically. Yes, you make it mad. <laughs> a lot of times you can go out there and you think you got it under control, and you come back a day or two, and you end up having more there than what you did before. It can grow in both dry and wet soils. It really prefers wet soils. Um, so right now, if you're in an area that's not getting much rainfall, if you've got irrigation or even downspouts to your house for maybe a little dew coming off of it in the morning times, those are the areas that it's going to concentrate in. I see it around irrigation heads. And sometimes it can help identify if you've got an irrigation problem. If you see a patch of yellow nut sedge somewhere, um, that area may be a stuck head that's not spinning. So you may want to check into that for the future, for especially for long-term yellow nut sedge control. It is, again, isolated in those wetter areas. One can do something about this in that respect? Yes, there's a couple products out there. One is uh, active ingredient sulfentrazone, which is in many of the products that you can find at, uh, at a lawn and garden store or a big box store. And there's another product, active ingredient halosulfuron. That one's commonly called sedge hammer. It works really well. It may take multiple applications as it's a tough plant to kill, but it, it works really well in, in for home lawns. But you really, if optimal, if you could get those applications out earlier than later, then what you're going to do is you're going to prevent those mature plants from making more of those tubers. So sooner than later is better when it comes to applying these products for yellow nut sedge control. And brown patch disease. Here's another common problem in Kansas lawns, and it's somewhat prolific right now, even in our droughty conditions, right? It is. So brown patch is a disease that affects tall fescue, cool season lawns. It really likes wet areas that may have been where the leaf stays wet for a long period of time. So if you're watering at night and your grass is staying wet all night long, um, you have more opportunity to getting brown patch. Airflow also um, has a lot to do with it. Uh, wind blows always in Kansas, <laughs> but I know some of us have wind breaks and fenced in backyards, and that just seems like it can produce a perfect culture for growing brown patch. So yeah, even with even with the lack of rainfall, a, the high humidity um, and dew on the grass, and and even an afternoon small rain shower really can lead to brown patch infestation in your lawn. And can it easily be distinguished from the ultra dry conditions or drought? Yes. Stress? So it does. It sometimes is confused with just droughty patches in the lawn. An easy way to identify to make sure that you know you have brown patches, you can go right to the edge of where it's brown and green. Um, and you can look at some of those leaves, and there's these distinct lesions that are on these leaves that, that are like little burn strips, maybe with a little black on the edges of them. Um, that is the easiest way to tell. And if that's the case, then you can say, yes, this is brown patch and, and not drought. Right. Well, you advocate a twofold approach to controlling brown patch, cultural management and treatments. What about the cultural side of it? Well, there's a couple cultural things uh, that you can do. I mentioned one, irrigation. If you can irrigate in the morning, that would be the best because then you can get the water to the soil that the plant needs. And then as soon as the sun comes up, it dries out really, the leaves dry out really quick. So you don't have that continual leaf wetness, but you've still supplied the water to the soil. Uh, One of the other common problems we see is over-fertilizing. A lot of times, if you over-fertilize in the summertime, it can stimulate some of the growth of this plant. So we recommend just sticking to your, your standard fall 
applications for your your tall fescue fertility program with a spring application if you if you have to have it. But uh, one might want to also look for the short term here at a fungicide application. Yes, there are some products out there that uh, homeowners can get for brown patch. Uh, there's another product, azoxystroman, is the active ingredient. It's commonly called a heritage. Um, homeowners may have to call a commercial applicator to put this down, but it works really, really well. Um, and you still, even if it is applied, a fungicide is applied, you still may see some damage for a while. Just hope that we get some better weather around the state and it grows back in. As always, Jared, good to have you, Mike's side. Thanks for coming over. Thank you. I appreciate it. He's an extension turf grass specialist at K State. That's Jared Hoyle. He's been our guest on this week's. K-State Horticulture segment. That caps off our Thursday edition. We'll return this same time tomorrow. Hope you'll tune in then once again. Meantime, thanks for listening. Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.